Hello and welcome to the West Yorkshire Football Show. Now, Bradford City lost 3-0 at home to Knox County on Tuesday, which was their third loss at home on the bounce, which pretty much ends any playoff ambitions the Bantams had. With problems on and off the pitch, we're taking a deep dive on this Bradford City show special and asking how on earth did Bradford City fall so far and what needs to happen next. I'm Stephen Brown and joining me is our usual Bradford City contributor, Gareth Walker, Friend of the show and width of the post writer Jason McEwen, and to get an outsider's perspective as well, we've got Lewis Sale. Please pop a like and get your comments in. And if you're watching us on YouTube or Twitter, and if you're listening on Spotify, please do leave us a rating and review. You can also subscribe on YouTube and Spotify for more content on all our teams across West Yorkshire as well. Okay, so good evening, gentlemen. Now, just before we get into the bones of this, Bradford City did lose again uh, to Knox County the other night, 3 0. Uh, I'll come to you first. Gaz, was this as bad as the Mansfield game and what were your thoughts on the match overall? Um, it was bad, but probably for different reasons. I thought that Mansfield, we were all over the place. Um, Notts County, I thought, well, Graham Alexander said afterwards that he thought that all the team had put a shift in. Um, I disagree with that. I think probably the majority of them did, probably two-thirds, but there were certain players that I thought were off it and quite a way off it, didn't look particularly interested. Uh, you've also got the caveat that Notts County were in such bad form, so to come to our place and stick three past us without reply um, is sort of a bit harrowing in itself, really. Um, yeah, so it was bad, but maybe not quite as bad as Mansfield. The worry is the drop-off for me since Accrington, when we played really well at Accrington. Um, I wrote the match report for Jason that day for for the Post, and, and we were really good and thoroughly deserved to win 3-0. So the way that we've fallen off since then... Um, and like I said, the attitude of certain players I thought on Tuesday night wasn't great. Yeah, indeed. And I know we'll get into this more a little bit later, but there has been whispers of a bit of discontent, possibly with Graham Alexander's managerial capabilities from inside the dressing room as well. Um, let's just get a bit of context to this, though. Let's just rewind to this time last season. And Mark Hughes was the manager and City were on course for the playoffs. Jason, at that time... Uh, and coming into this season, what were your expectations at this point? I think um, coming into the season, I think there was definitely a feeling that it was going to be a lot more difficult. Um, it felt like a real opportunity last season that we missed because the division was obviously weaker than what we knew was coming this season when you've got people like Wrexham and Notts County going into the league, Gillingham having more money, MK Don's coming down to it as well. You, you felt it was going to be a bit more trickier and it would be quite a, a tough ask to get into the playoffs again. But I think the level of drop-off overall this season has been more surprising than we would have expected. Um, we have threatened occasionally to get close to the playoffs places and potentially get into contention there, but we've never really convinced all season. And we just look so so often so far behind other teams. And it's one of the things every year, I think, Bradford City fans' frustration is that you always see teams who've got a fraction of the budget, a fraction of the fan base that are outperforming Bradford City. And you can take your pick of so many clubs this season who... You know, as much as we might talk about, you know, how can you compete with teams like Wrexham in terms of their financial back backing, what's going on there? There's other teams uh, in between us and Wrexham who have got far less budgets and you know far less fan base and supporter base and stuff like that who are outperformers at the moment. So it just really underlines the scale of the underachievement. Yeah, absolutely. And there's so many factors and, and issues all over the place it's with Bradford City at the moment from it can be ownership level, management, players. Um, Gaz, I want to come back to you um, as we've talked about different areas of issue. Let's first of all start with the manager. Uh, you know, when Graham Alexander was appointed, I think there was some optimism around that decision and there's been obviously good spells since he's taken over. What's been your assessment of how he's done in the job and, and how he's actually handling this at the moment? Um, you probably noticed me on previous pods, Brownie. I, I've, I've been quite positive about Alexander compared to a lot of fans and, I, and I've tried to stick with him to a certain extent when other fans have been quick to get on his back. Uh, people have complained about his style of play, which, yeah, you can complain about his style of play, but a lot of them are the same people that were complaining about Mark Hughes' style of play, which was the antithesis of what Graham Alexander plays, and he struggled to get it both ways, especially in League Two. Um, there's been complaints about his team selections, and I think a lot of them are valid. Um, people are happy that uh, Bobby Poynton has been sort of completely left out for the last sort of month or so. Um, he's stuck with players like Clark Odewar, um, who was poor and then had a good spell, but seems to have gone back to being poor again. Um, 
yeah, th- there are issues with team selection and, and, and he's thoroughly deserves criticism for that. I get, um, I feel that his demeanour's changed quite a lot since he first came in. He was quite up and positive, and now he does just looks completely down in the dumps. Um, you talk about our form. Our form's been so well. You'd almost call it bipolar. I know a lot of teams are inconsistent at our, at, in League Two, but um, we had a, a tough spell when he first came in. When we, we 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 lost the first couple of games, then we went on a on a good run where we we were sort of near the top of the form table, um, and I think we, we we broke a club record except since the eighties where we won so many games in a row. Or we're unbeaten for so many games in a row either way. Then we went on another bad run where we couldn't win for Toffee again. Then we've just come off the back of a good run where we were second in the form table and flying as of the Accrington game. And then the last three games have just been horrendous. We've got absolutely totally outplayed at home, particularly the last two. I know Forest Green was slightly different in the way that we sort of gave them something to hold on to and, and they scrapped for their lives. But yeah, it just seems that we're just compliment and there's just absolutely zero inconsistency. And there's nothing to sort of hold on to for no hope for City fans at the moment. Yeah, I mean, Jason, you finished off your match report and I would urge any Bradford City fan who doesn't read with the post to, to get on and read the articles because they are really brilliant, uh, even from a non Bradford City sporting fan. Um, you signed off your match report by saying we're witnessing the slow extinction of Bradford City Football Club. Who's to blame for this in your eyes? I think everyone, to be honest, that, that's part of the problem. I think looking at players are underachieving, there's no doubt about that. There's There's got to be questions about their character and their commitment. Um, already seen off Mark Hughes this season and don't like the playing for Graham Alexander at the moment. I think Alexander has struggled a lot. Um, I've got some sympathy for him because I think that he was probably the wrong person to bring in. Um, for me, when you've had Mark Hughes playing a certain way in a certain style of football and you're in a sack him, Going to a completely different style of football and a totally different approach is just is just ridiculous for me, and and, and that's just it, it's really difficult. You know, if you're going to play a long ball guy like Graham Alexander, fair enough, but you've got to build that up there. You can't go from playing passing football to that and expect it to work. It was just he's, he's, he's set up to fail. But having said that, some of his team selections over the last few games and the way he's been doing tactically are really really poor. Um, substitutions uninspiring. His post match comments after Notts County game were really disappointing and just felt like he you know he's gone from being quite an honest guy and who tells it like it is to someone who just i don't know what game he was watching with on tuesday really um but then you got blamed to you know the, the recruitment there that got him in in charge you know from my back ceo in terms of that that whole recruitment thing after sacking mark hughes for me i'd like to have kept hughes a bit longer but we decided to, to, to take him out when we did and and to be fair to referring to Sparks in the club a lot of fans wanted mark hughes to go then so it was a popular decision but I think to sack a manager without a plan of what to do next and to spend over a month looking around for a manager, a bit of a dalliance for Kevin McDonald and potentially trying to get him to become the manager, you get to a point where the caretakers had enough that they, they want to stand down. So people turning down the job, um, several people reportedly have turned down that job and walked away for whatever reason, which is never a good thing. And then to bring a game out of that was really poor and that's really cost us, I think, this season. And then obviously at the top of that, you've got, got um, Stefan Rupp and... You know, the thing with Stefan Rupp as owner is he's he's financially very, very capable, probably the richest guy we've ever had in charge of Bob City in our history. But he's got that deep pocket said that mean when things aren't going well and we've had some difficult moments over the last few years without a doubt, he's there to pop up the club and keep the lights open, lights on. And that's that's a good thing to an extent. But there's no infrastructure being built at this football club. There's no not enough investment into the day to day running of the club in terms of the staff behind the scenes, in terms of the football, what's going on there. There's no football expertise at the football club beyond the manager who's in the most vulnerable position of anyone and is always going to lose their job and there's a bad run in the form. And that's on Stefan Rupp that he hasn't appointed people in there to do those things. And it becomes a difficult moment, really, because as a club, we need investment. And unfortunately, it's unavoidable. We need people to be in there doing the jobs really, really well. It's not happening. And for, and for Stefan Rupp, he's a distant owner. He didn't really want to buy the football club in the first place. He got his arm kind of twisted. He's, he's a bit of a reluctant owner. He doesn't want to be in the spotlight, all those things. And he's not a bad person. And we shouldn't, personally, I wouldn't want to attack him as a person. I think he's a really decent guy. But he's not the right person to take on a club like Bradford City with all the emotional fan base, with a big support base that's underachieving massively, that needs real hands on work to get us back to where we need to be. He's not going to provide that. He's not going to set that up because to the extent he doesn't know how to do that. And I think that's where ultimately everything like falls down, really. And I think the biggest problem this season, what we've seen is that it's really become a really dawning realisation that as a football club, in order to progress properly, 
there has to be a change of, of ownership because we need someone to come in with that drive, with that football now, with that investment to really turn around Bradford City because it requires a lot of work and we cannot do it as a quick fix anymore. Indeed. Uh, Lewis, I just want to come to you as, as an outsider to Bradford City. Obviously, you, you're well known on this channel as, as supporting the other Bradford team, Park Avenue. When you look at this situation going on with City, what's your perspective on it? I think Jason and, and Gaz have kind of um, said a lot about this situation. And I, I think it is a million dollar question is what I don't think it's necessarily who's to blame. I think it's what areas of improvement needed in this club to make it better. Um, you know, I think I might be slightly controversial here, but I think, you know, outside looking in, you know, Bradford City have kind of been a traditional League Two team out of the past 16 seasons, been in this division, you know, 10 times. Had a decent spell in League One before getting relegated. Um, but obviously what comes with Bradford City is that expectation, that fan base and, and kind of the history and the past what goes along with it. I think there's a massive amount of expectation that comes with Bradford City um, because of the numbers that basically go through, you know, through the turnstiles and, and obviously what a... You know, obviously, present social media and watching from afar. Um, f for me, um, I, I know I've said it in, in previous podcasts we've hosted that I, I think getting rid of Alexander might not be the right answer at this moment in time. I don't think that solves the issues. I think there's many factors in this. Um, you know, I think Jason makes some really, really valid and, and, and well educated points there about the infrastructure behind it. Again, we, we said this, didn't we, on Monday about. You know, where, is there a board at Bradford City? You know, who who are these people accountable to? Um, obviously, there's been a lot of changes recently with the manager in, in, in the dugouts. You know, we've seen a lot of managers come and go. Obviously, that will be money out out the out the back door as well to help pay some of these people off as well. Um, I think there's a combination of factors, and I, and I I can completely appreciate why you know Bradford City fans are feeling really frustrated about the current situation in terms of the ownership in terms of the players but i also will say is you know bradford city yes have lost three games in the space of a week which really does kind of highlight the bad situation and a bad feeling at the moment but obviously and i think graham alexander said it today actually in his press conference you know they just need a bit of consistency it doesn't it might mask over some of the issues and i don't think you know winning games will solve everything but you know almost what two three months ago was the same being said just despite obviously losing three massive games in the space of a week at home really doesn't really doesn't help. So I think yeah, there's a, there's a lot of factors in this, um, and I think also quite selfish from living in the, in in the city as well. Um, the city needs a good, thriving, successful Bradford City as well um, to prosper. Um, and obviously at the moment that's not the case. And you know we are used to seeing big attendances down at Valley Parade. And in the moment, especially the last home game, which we've seen pictures and videos of it, that you know doesn't isn't at the moment the case because of the frustration that's been there. But we all know winning games does help. It doesn't, you know, like I say, it doesn't fix everything. Um, but I know there's there's so much frustration, and so it's it's really interesting to hear the points from from you guys, and obviously the people commenting because, like Jason said, I think there's I think there's a bit of work. I don't think there's a massive amount of work to make City successful. I think it's proven it can be done. I think the the biggest issue is if, and it is a massive if, you know, the people at the top do leave. Is what does the future look like for Bradford City? Does who is that? person people consortium coming in doing you know we talk we hear about you know um potentially people wanting football people in inverted commas at the top of the top of a tree to help look after some of the footballing matters and help some of those who you know who may not been in this situation before there's plenty of people in the world of football it's a small world that people will still want to come to Bradford City and get involved in it um and I think the interesting point is again massive if if Ruff, if Ruff was to sell you know, at the moment, is it a saleable asset? I think Bradford City probably is a saleable asset in this division. I think if you look at it out from the outside, if you do get relegated, I think it's a completely different story. I think if Rupp was to potentially sell, and I have no idea whether he does or not, um, I think this is probably the time to do it right now. Yeah. Um, Gaz, is this the lowest ebb it's been as a Bradford City fan, do you think, since you've supported them? Um. And I started going sort of just over 30 years ago. Um, I'd say the lowest I felt in that time was just before Parkinson came in. 
uh, when Peter Jackson was manager. I remember the first game of the season. I think we lost at home to Aldershot in the first game of that season. And I honestly thought that without change, we'd get relegated into the non-league that year. Um, obviously, Phil Parkinson came in and changed it all around, and, and we went on to have great success or very reasonable success during that time. Um, since then, this is the first time, and I came away on Tuesday night. And I thought, if this carries on into next season, we'll get relegated next season. And, I, and I, that's the first time I've felt like that since those Peter Jackson went days before Parkinson came in. Uh, there's a lot of factors behind that. Like Jason said, like Lou said, the, you know, it's not one person's fault. It's a lot of people's fault that we're in this particular predicament. You know, yeah, the Stefan Rupp's to blame, Ryan Sparks is to blame. There's all sorts of people to blame. That, but it's not their fault that... Graham Alexander didn't play Brad Holiday and didn't play Andy Cook against Mansfield. Do you know what I mean? So the, the, there's issues all around the place. Um, but yeah, I would say is the lowest the lowest that I've felt since probably about 10, 12 years ago. Um, and and I am worried, very worried about next season and, and that we'll be exiting the league the, the wrong way. Uh, if you're watching along, if you could, please pop a like on the video, subscribe to the channel as well. And if you're watching along on Twitter, please do get it retweeted as well. Much appreciated. Lewis, were you just about to come in then, mate? Sorry. I, I, I was just going to ask probably for you guys as well. It, obviously, it feels real low at the moment. And I think my my question to both of you is, is it feeling as low because there feels to be a, very much of a disconnect, I think, between the club and the fans at the moment? I think, obviously, with any club goes under a bit of a difficult situation, it, you know, sometimes you see people kind of pulling together and really wanting to, it's almost a bit of a, gal, it kind of galvanises people, but from the outside looking in, I'm not too sure that that's the case. I don't know how you guys feel about that. Got to take that, Jess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's what you're saying is, is, is absolutely right. And disconnect is a big problem. And the thing that worries me, and, the, and it's kind of why I ended the match report for the last time again, talking about the slow extinction of Bradford City, is that the drop off in supporter interest is really, really worrying. And as much as we can, you know, you can flippantly say, well, we've just lost three games in a week, so calm down, everyone. This is a problem that's been going on for quite a few months with the crowds. And even when we've had a good spell recently, like beating MK Dons on a Tuesday night, even going to the Forest Green game where things were looking up, the attendances were absolutely terrible. No one was coming along. They were really, really poor. Notts County game was 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 shockingly bad, but all the Tuesday night games since Christmas have been really, really poor. And even some of the Saturday games have been. And there's so many people. I mean, me and Gaz know lots of people who support Bradford City, lots of friends there. And there's so many people now we speak to who just won't go to games, just lost interest, just don't want to know. They've still got season tickets for this season, but they've not been for a long time and they don't plan to come back. There's people who are saying they're not going to renew next season. And this is a really, really worrying thing for me because that is, we've always had good support and numbers. And even when you go back to t- times like Gaz has talked about there in terms of pre Phil Parkinson, when, when things were, look, were looking bleak, there was still a massive interest in the football club and there was still a bit more togetherness than as, as, as fans um, with, you know, with the club. And, and it still felt more in it together. And although there was still a bit of, you know, numbers weren't necessarily spectacular then, they were still pretty decent, but I think you're seeing you're going to see a really big drop off in season ticket sales next season. I think the club have made a massive error in that they put season tickets on sale at the cheaper price than the expire for the, the offer for that is before the final game of the season. So basically, they're expecting everyone who wants to buy it at a reasonable rate, you know, before it goes up to a significant more amount before the end of the season when people are feeling incredibly disillusioned and unhappy, and that's just not going to happen. And you, sometimes you need that as a fan, don't you? We've all been there where you've been sick of your team, it's been rubbish season, bring on the summer, I've had enough. And then you get to summer and you start to miss it a bit, don't you? You go, ah, you know what, you know what I'll buy a season you guys for after all, forgive them, forget it a little bit. And then when people get to that point, Brother City supporters, they're going to end up in the summer where the price has gone up so much that it's going to put them off again even further. So it just seems, it just seems like a really bizarre, bad strategy to me why you would do that with season ticket sales. It just feels like we're, we're setting ourselves up to fail even further. And just a final point on that as well before I go as you jump in is the disconnect part of it is the lack of communication this season. There's just been absolutely non-existent from, from the club to supporters. The way we have been treated, I think, as fans is just absolutely terrible and not, and not good enough. We've seen the occasional interview, which at times has been embarrassing, I think, really, some of the some of the, some of the stuff we've seen, some of the interviews we've had, such as the Graham Alexander Press Club, the Lions Park speaking then, the Radio Leeds Forum that happened when fans weren't invited and they called it a fans forum. Some of the things said there, it was just incredibly uninspiring. And there just hasn't been that open communication and talking to supporters, which would help to get people on the side. I think if there was a bit of honesty and a bit of humbleness and to say, look, 
we're having a bad season. Things we tried the, these things here, they haven't worked. Now we're going to try this going to summer. That would give fans a bit more confidence. But right now, there's just nothing to take away to think, well, we'll get better. There's nothing that inspires you about the, the decisions the club has made this season that makes you think in the summer they'll make better decisions. It just feels like there's no hope there at all. And that's where the disconnect comes from. I, I think, Mecca, I think that's another really good point. And I know a lot of people have said that as well. And again, as a neutral, that's what's really surprised me is the lack of communication, a lack of um, just just a statement, just a kind of does it. It's not going to fix everything. It's it's probably putting a plaster over a big gaping wound, isn't it? But at least something's been said. Um, and I think even the season ticket campaigns seem to go quite under the radar compared to recent years as well. You know, in terms of the publicity, the promotion, the advertising has been massive across the city and this year. I'd, already, it's just kind of just slipped under. And I think with the current situation, I, I don't think it would harm to come out and just kind of be open and, and be as transparent. Because, I mean, you guys know far better than me. You know, you, you've been very good in the fan engagement stats, haven't you, recently? I think you were top 10 or, you know, you were doing really well in that. I think even at the beginning of the, the new ownership, they were very open and, you know, we're you know, actually saying that, weren't we? We're happy to speak and be really open and honest. And I think this is where the frustration is because, obviously, it has you have had it. And now it's it's just not it's not the same as what it was. And even if times are tough, you've just you still got to carry it out, haven't you? And it might be tough, and it might not always be easy to hear you, but you you've got to kind of follow through with what you said. Um, I don't, I don't think there's much more to add on, other than what Jason said. I think he, he's covered a lot of it there. What what I would just say, obviously, the the fan engagement and and the crowds are absolutely frightening. They're really really worrying. You'll you'll have all seen the pictures that went round on Tuesday night. Uh, which is obviously a worry in itself, but it's also a worry because we're supposedly self-sustainable and um, any money that comes through the turnstiles is what our budget is for next season. And when you're looking around the ground and you're thinking that this is going to be a real problem next season, our crowds are going to be so low, the budget's going to be hugely reduced. And when we're struggling to compete on, what it, well, say struggling to compete, but when we're underachieving on a top seven budget, what are we going to be like when we're on a, such, a, such a lower budget next season? Um, that that adds to the worry about about where we're going to end up at the end of next season. Um, you've also, I, I will just add, yeah, communication is a major major issue. I can kind of understand why Ryan doesn't speak sometimes because everything he does say is is thrown back at him. Like he'll make a comment and and someone will snip it and and it like we do not accept mediocrity as football club. That that goes round and round and round and round. He's beating over the head with it time and time again. Um, but he just need, he still needs to speak, and he still maybe maybe he needs to maybe he needs a bit of advice on what he says when he does speak. But the communication has to be there. Um, you've got the the added point that in that radio Leeds interview or forum, as it was described, it came out that Stefan Rook's only aim for the football club is to not get relegated and not go bust. How does that speak to supporters? Where's the ambition? How are you going to get people to come through? You get your turnstiles when that is the that is the aim from the top of the football club. It's just majorly, majorly, majorly worrying. Yeah, indeed. Um, there's some brilliant comments coming in as well that I want to uh, I want to get to. Um, Chris Hall, I mean, they're, they're for a start of £434 for my season ticket for next season. As you said, Jason, ticket uh, increases by 25% and wanting people to renew before the end of what's been a pretty appalling season. Um, Paul here, um, Alexander must stay in the club, needs a director of football as a buffer between Rupp and Sparks and Alexander. And Alexander needs his own. Uh, his own scout um, various opinions on Ryan Sparks actually obviously is a point of contention at the moment Martin here says Ryan Sparks position is untenable um, but then Paul does argue Sparks must stay uh, the market around the club right now is A1 with more investment than we have ever had Sparks is just in the wrong role in terms of Ryan Sparks specifically uh, there Jason is that right has he done a good job in, in one sense but this kind of idea that he, he he knows who to pick as a manager, what to do in a football sense is just misguided. Yeah, I think a lot of the off-the-field stuff has been very good over the last few years. And I think there's a genuine commitment from Ryan and a genuine desire within him to want to make this football club better, to want to do a good job for supporters, to make the match day experience better. And commercially, things have been much more professional. Um, there's been lots of improvements there. There's no doubt about that. And he deserves he deserves credit for that. I think as well, he's also hampered by the lack of infrastructure around him. Um, you know, he's asked to do a heck of a lot. He's got, you know, he's got to have some fairly broad shoulders to do this job. He's only 
a relatively young person. It's his first time doing some this kind of a job. So I think we do have to factor those things in there that he needs more support ideally around him and more people there. Um, the, the biggest weakness is the football side. You know, there's no doubt about it. You know, the decisions made on managers to come in haven't worked out in terms of some of the decisions about the, the, the recruitment approaches, although it's good to try and be more scientific and bring in people to help with that. They've not been working out on that side of it as well. And I think that's where he, he needs some more support and help on there. And I think it's something that we've said many, many times and there's obviously comment just there saying about directors of football. Having someone who can help him alongside him, who knows football, who knows the industry that well and knows that side of things really, really well, would just make such a big difference, I think, to, to everything at this football club and just allow Ryan to still be in charge and still to oversee everything, but to have that support there to help to do that. And we talk about it a lot all the time. It's something a massive debate with me and friends and other people speak to. You've got someone local like Paul Jewell, who has been a director of football at Swindon and did a good job there for, um, to an extent in quite a difficult circumstances because it wasn't ownership weren't popular down in Swindon at the time and stuff like that, but got and promoted Richie Wellens and stuff like that. There's probably someone on the doorstep there who's almost in the past begged to sort of say, you know, I'll come and help out the football club. I'm here and I can, I've got expertise to help. Offers like that and people like that who could get involved, I just think could make such a big difference because they've been there, done that. And not just like, they're not just you know, Bradford City ex-managers and therefore they know a bit of football. The people who have actually done directors of football roles like that and just, could just help out. And I think that's the wish for me. You know, I, I, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a decent guy at heart, Ryan Sparks. And I don't want to sit here and start being critical and jump on that because there are plenty of people doing that at this moment in time. But he needs support. And if I was him, I'd be reaching out to Stefan Rupp. I'd reach out to people saying, please, can you just help me to do this job better? Yeah, indeed. Um, comment here I want to get from Rocket Fuel. Thanks, mate. Um, you can't have a sustainable club when you have no assets. It's like being trapped in an endless cycle of renting a house and a car and living on credit. Obviously, this is the big idea in, in football, isn't it, at the moment, trying to be self-sustainable. I mean, Lewis, we've heard a lot of that talk at Bradford Park Avenue, haven't we, over the last few months. What I don't understand with Bradford City is, I mean, this is a club that could attract someone with the reputation of Mark Hughes, whatever you may think about Mark Hughes, it was a huge, huge name. The crowds, obviously, we, we're talking about um, you know an apathy in the fan base and declining crowds, but it's still a huge crowd comparatively to the rest of League Two. Why isn't there potential investors banging on the door to take over this club and, and get it up the league? What what is going on? There might be. There might be in the background. Um, it, this is what we said about you know other clubs, aren't we? Depends on the valuation. Depends on what comes with that football club and you know we do know the situation at City where they don't own the ground and they don't own the training ground either so somebody's gonna have to come in if we were to take Bradford City on and take it away from Stefan Rupp and pay probably a little bit more over the odds to take it off him and obviously if it come with that is do you buy the stadium off Gordon Gibbs pension fund which comes at a cost as well the training ground they obviously train at a school at the moment so if somebody wants to come in and the ideal situation is Bradford City have you know, assets of themselves in that areas, that's going to cost a lot of money in terms of actually buying that piece of land, infrastructure to build all those things. So they might, I, I, I don't think Bradford City would be short of investors. Um, I think it would probably be more of a consortium, if I'm being honest, um, of people that would be involved, whether that's commercially driven, that people may be in Bradford or it could be overseas. I, I don't think um, there's going to be a shortage and obviously it was quite the, the famous one wasn't it, a few years ago, obviously with the people that went to Crawley. So uh, their interest will be there, Bradford City still carry a name despite the situation they currently find themselves in, despite being in League Two. Um, they're still an attractive asset. It just depends on the valuation and whether people are willing to meet that. Um, so when that comes into play, business people are going to actually think about what return investment am I going to get? For, you know, in terms of Bradford City, in terms of actually potentially being an offer of an attractable um, club to buy, you know, if they are sustainable and self-sustainable as the way they are, that actually might sing to quite a few people. But obviously, like Jason and, and Gaz have said before, this is why probably they're really concerned about the attendances because actually those people that are coming through the turnstile are going towards a playing budget, hoping to get that expectation of being promoted. Without that, Bradford City's expectations are probably going to have to be lowered and actually the ambition probably changes a little bit. So I think obviously that's where the worry is. I, I, 
like I say, I don't know the situation we're up at all um, in terms of whether he's willing to sell or not. But um, for somebody to come in and take that on is going to be a huge task. And I think with that, like I say, there's a lot of big jobs. There aren't, there aren't little jobs to do. You know, they are huge, huge things to undertake and they've got to have the infrastructure behind them to do it. So I know there's been report, you know, like reported fees about what that might cost, but it won't cost just that. It's going to cost probably nearly enough double. Just want to raise a point here. This was mentioned in the comments earlier, um, Paul here. The Gordon Gibb Trust is scaring investors getting close to the club. Now, Gaz, I know we mentioned this on the West Yorkshire uh, Football Show, our Monday weekend review. I think we either did it this week or maybe a previous week. But do you want to just tell us who the Gordon Gibb Trust is and why they might be scaring potential investors? Um, I, don't, I don't know, to be honest. All, all I know, um, I'm not going to claim to know the ins and outs of it. Um, all I know is that Gordon Gibbs, a former chairman of Bradford City Football Club. He owned the club with Julian Rhodes, probably going back about 20 years now, maybe a bit more. And when the deal was made that Julian Rhodes took sole share of the sole ownership of the club, Gordon Gibb, basically his pension fund owns the ground. And we pay rent every year to play a Valley Parade and that money goes to Gordon Gibbs' pension fund who own the ground. Um, and I know the deal is coming up. It's been... The, the the length of the deal is over a set period of time, but as it, I think it's already been renewed. Has it already been renewed once, Jason? I'm not sure. No, no, it's due this to renew. First time it's up for renewal. It's coming up for renewal in the next few years, and obviously there's talk about whether we'll be um, renewing the deal, whether we want to renew the deal, whether he'll renew the deal, what what terms that the, that deal will be on. Um, so yeah, that that that's the situation, um, and then the rent is is believed to be extremely high and extortionate. Um, for where we are, but I believe that it's relative to what league we're in at the time as well. Um, I would just add that, like what what was said there about um, people buying the club, in you know, and whether there's interest in it. That's why we need to hear from Stefan Rupp. That's why we need to know what his plan is for the football club, whether he's happy being a football club owner, whether he wants to sell the club. That all comes back to a plan, his plan, and then that filters down into the plan that we need at a footballing level for a style of play, director of football, a transfer policy, a recruitment policy. There's just no plan at any level of the football club, or there doesn't appear to be. And if there is, we need to hear what the plan is, because then when results aren't so good on the pitch and things aren't necessarily going well, we have something to fall back on when there's a bit of a plan. If you can see a plan at the top and you can see a plan in football in terms, then everything's not always result-based and it's not built on sand. Um, but yeah, just going back to Gordon Gibb, I don't know the legalities of it all at all. I, I, I can only say what I've just said, that his pension fund owns the ground and and the trustees of that pension fund are legally required to act in the best interest of that pension fund, in, i.e. get the best value for money that they can every time the deal comes up for a, for renewal, which obviously they'll be doing when it comes up in is it 2028, 20, 2028, I think. Um, that's the next time it's up for renewal and they have to legally get the best deal for the, the members of the pension fund, which puts Bradford City in a, in a tough position. Yeah, is that something you're concerned about as well, Jason? Yeah, um, I mean, as Gaz, Gaz said about that, really, it's important to say that it gets mentioned that Gordon gives pension fund and Gordon gives its pay as a villain and to an extent that's, that's fair because I think the argument probably going back to 2002 when Gordon Gibb was a chairman and obviously Bradford City were having some real financial problems. So 2003, the, he, he brokered this deal to sell Valley Parade to the, to the Gibb Pension Fund um, for £2.5 million. Pounds. And the question mark is obviously whether that was a fair fee at the time. Obviously, at the time, the club were desperate for money. They were, had a um, mortgage lender on their back. They had a lot of money and they had to do something to get some money there. But there's an argument to say he took an asset there quite cheap and that was actually had a bigger market value from there. But from this point onwards, it's basically a legal thing, really, that as, as a pension fund, they're required to get the best returns they can do for the members of that pension fund, which is the entire Gibb family. And there's been talk in the past about trying to renegotiate the rents and things like that. But ultimately, the aim of that pension fund is to get the most money they can do, not to look after Bradford City in that same sense. So that's always been the challenge and we'll be getting to 2028. Obviously, it's going to be a bit of a game of who blinks first, I think, when you get closer, because if you're the Gibb uh, pension fund, you know, clearly you need Bradford City to stay at Valley Parade. Otherwise, you've got a worthless asset in a, you know, in a, fairly run down part of the city let's be honest it's not going to be worth anything without Bradford City and we know that to an extent but equally if we've got nowhere else to play we can't you know as much as we might pretend we might be able to go somewhere else or do something else we, they know we can't walk away from it either really as well so it will be interesting to see how that goes and one thing in Ryan Sparks' favour I think is that he's 
obviously are actively in dialogue with Gordon Gibb and with the pensions trustees to try and get better relations because they weren't great at all for quite a few years. I think Gordon Gibb's been to a game or two recently and stuff like that. So he's, he's certainly, there's actually a relationship there now. And that might be that when it comes to that moment then, there is potential to something that might happen that can help Bradford City. Um, what we need in the long run ultimately is to buy our own ground back. That's that's the bottom line. And when you're talking about the investors, we've talked about them before, um, that, that's the key challenge, isn't it? Because as an investor, you're taking on basically a, a share in the Football League. That's kind of the only asset Bradford City has at this moment in time. And if you're prepared to really get it going, you're going to have to take on not just buying the football club, but potentially buying the stadium, build, building a training ground, et cetera, et cetera. But probably a very little return unless you can get them up into the championship, which year on year becomes much more difficult. So that's all the challenges there at this moment in time. So it, it's down to it as an investor who's willing to sort of take that long game and put quite a lot of money at the football club at the start to do these things, build it up and then potentially get those rewards if you can get Bradford City up, up a couple of leagues. But it's a big gamble to be fair and you need quite deep pockets, I think, to achieve that. Yes, yeah, comment here from Joseph. Hate to say we need to move from Valley Parade. Too much of a hindrance financially. Move outside the city centre. Most of the fans travel in anyway. Get somewhere with parking. Again, obviously, we touched on this the other night. Gaz, is that something you would potentially like to see or or is the routes with Valley Parade just too deep? Um, I think it's different for every supporter. Every supporter is going to have a different view on that. There'll be certain people that just will not want to leave Valley Parade at all because the emotional ties from obviously disaster years ago. So you can't comment. I can't speak for everybody. I can't say, yeah, we all, it, the fan base would want to leave. Personally, if it's going to save Bradford City leaving, then then you've got to think about leaving. Um, but there'll be thousands and thousands of people that will just not want to consider leaving Valley Parade at all. So I totally empathise with those people. And, and like I say, I wouldn't want to be in the position that the, the owners of the football club are in or the people that are in charge of making that decision are in because it's such a tough decision to make. Uh, as an individual, maybe I would be more like more willing to leave than others. Um, but like I say, I can sort of understand why some people would never want to leave. Jason, leaving Valley Parade, is that something you could ever envisage, really? Uh, it's something I would find incredibly difficult and I wouldn't be, be in favour personally because there are so many emotional ties and when you obviously you, you go back to 1985 and what happened there you know the fact that supporters lost their lives in this stadium you know just gives us gives I think Bradford City support an emotional tie with the football ground that I know everyone every football fan loves their own their own club's ground but I think this is a little bit different when something like that has happened um, if you're talking about with your head on and moving your heart away from that as well, that was it. Obviously, there's arguments to say about doing it, but I still find it hard to believe that going away and trying to build a, a, a stadium somewhere else um, that's equally as big capacity-wise as, as Valley Parade and can fit the purposes of the club. Because I think 25,000 is, is a good overall capacity to have for what Bradford City's potential is. I think that the cost of doing that versus being able to buy back Valley Parade, to me, it just seems it doesn't seem sensible to me. There is some problems at Bradford City. Though. I think the Valley Parade is looking its age. There's certain parts of the ground now that just look really tatty and worn down and need some work in the TLC. And that includes both some investment as well. And anyone who's buying would be interested in buying the stadium is going to have to consider that as part of it as well. So there is still that challenge there. But I think overall, to me, it's easy, isn't it, for us as fans who don't have the money, but you know, asking someone to go and do it for us. But the idea would be buying back the stadium putting some work into really getting into a good place. And then we've got a fantastic ground that when, when it's buzzing, the atmosphere is just incredible and it's such a brilliant place to be. And I just can't imagine Bradford City being anywhere else. In terms of what the fans are thinking, what the fans are feeling at the moment, are there protest groups out there? What What's kind of happening or bubbling up as a result of the turmoil of, of this season, Gaz? Um, there's been a new group set up independent supporters group that's sort of sprung up this season um their aim i think is to get some dialogue going with stefan rupp um obviously as an independent supporters group they don't specifically have ties to bradford city football club the, the, it's a newish thing that they've asked that they've asked supporters to sign up to um the only thing i've seen on that really so far is that there was a petition sent to stefan in Germany, uh, asking him to basically come over and do a fans forum and speak to fans face to face. Uh, I don't know, or 
I believe, I, obviously I don't know the guys that, that organised all that, but I believe that the petition was never picked up by Stefan Rupp in Germany. Um, so what their next step will be, I don't know. Maybe they'll go to something else and try and try and make their views clear in other ways or, or get him to engage in a different kind of way. I, I honestly don't know. But it is kind of feeling like it's getting to that stage. There is um, a lot of supporter unrest, as you can see uh, on social media, as you can see by the empty seats in the ground. Whether that is enough for people to start to protest or to become more sort of vocal, I don't know, because there is also a lot of apathy at the moment as well, and apathy in itself is very worrying. Um, so whether there'll be any protests or whether there'll be any movements to um, get the ownership changed or to make or to try and force significant change at the top, I don't know. Uh, but it is something to be muted a bit more this season than in previous years. Indeed. Uh, Lewis, I mean, in terms of what fans can do and, and how active and vocal they can be, I mean, they can make a, a massive difference. I mean, what, what's your sense with, you know, you were at Valley Parade the other week. What's your sense of how the fans are, are reacting to what's going on? Yeah, I mean, when I've, when I've been over the years as a neutral to go and watch City, it's... It, it, obviously, like any football club, if you're doing well, you don't hear the murmurs, you don't hear the boos, you don't hear, get the contradictory comments. But obviously, when times are not going as well as as they should be or hope to be, um, obviously things change, don't they? And, and the, the kind of negativity and toxic does kind of dominate a lot of the terraces. When I were there on Tuesday against Forest Green, even though you know people might have a go at me for this, I actually don't think City played all that bad. I think the issue has been in recent games, you concede in early um, and to try and break down a low block um, with the way the City are playing at the moment and the creativity or kind of injuries, lack of creativity that you've got, it's difficult. Um, like I say, there were a lot of contradictory comments that I were hearing, you know, from what I believed, rightly or wrongly, Alexander, were trying to do the right thing to try and open the game up and, and widen the pitch as much as you could do, even though that right side near the main stand is, you know, it's boggy to say the least it doesn't have much grass on it i think to do that was difficult to play on um you know with people going oh hoof it forward let's get it forward and it was like that's probably not the best way to go when you've got andy cook up against um taylor moore and in innis as well that wasn't the right way to go and then when it started to go a little bit more direct at some points of the game people saying oh we need to get on the floor so the, at the moment I, there seems to be a lot of just different, you know, you can't win, I think, at the moment with Bradford City in terms of fans and what they want from the players and the management. In terms of what fans can do, um, listen, it's difficult. It's really difficult. I, you know, we don't want to see any kind of nastiness, don't want to see any of that stuff at all at any level. But fo football fans have such a massive say, as we've seen. You know, you only have to look at a few years ago with the, you know, proposal for the Super League. Um, and how fans came together to almost shoot that down straight away. Um, and, you know, these are, with a great respect to Bradford City, bigger clubs with bigger fan bases, with bigger prizes to play for. Um, and they almost pretty much stopped that happening. Um, and we've seen other places where, you know, the football fan is sometimes may not be as acknowledged as what football fans would hope to be, but... Um, they definitely have a say. I, I, I think, like Gaz said, I think there's going to be come to a point where the fans are going to say something. And I agree with what, what the guys have said. I think apathy, apathy sometimes is just the worst. You know, one of my, my best mate goes, and I were talking to him today about this, you know, and he says, you were walking down the Valley Parade on Saturday and it was just silence, just absolute silence. You know, people weren't talking to each other. They were going because the go. There, wasn't, there was probably no not much of an enjoyment. There wasn't much of... An anticipation of oh we're going to win the game it was well we've always done it so we're just going to go along anyway and see what happens um which is he's not good if you're a football fan you know i've been in there in that situation before and it, it is the worst feeling when you're going just for the sake of going and i know gas said this on monday didn't he you know at some points you know the bug does come and go it's a bit of a roller coaster but if you're not meeting your social friends and going have a few drinks or meeting up with family and friends you've not seen all week and you've worked hard for it um sometimes football can ruin a good day out. <laughs> the whole cliche yeah. kind of goes. So, yeah, the football fan's massive. What I would say, and I completely get the frustrations, and it's so difficult when your team's losing 3-0 you know, after you know nearly enough 20 minutes, is that the, the fans have almost got to somehow pull together as a collective. And it's difficult because they're in such a, a difficult situation at the moment. But 
you know, I will throw this out there. You know, the manager's not going to leave after 15, 20 minutes. So players can't just come off after 20 minutes. They've all got to stick it out until that 90 minutes. You're all in it together. And sometimes, yeah, the, the, there's got to be frustration and sometimes something's got to be done to possibly get the attention of the powers that be if they want them, you know, if they want to give the attention to them. But you've also got to really support your club through thick and thin. And I'm not saying the people are not, but there's got to be a collective in this where leaving after 20 minutes is that a good thing or a bad thing? We'll only know probably long term if people get the answers I want. Um, but like I say, Tuesday night when I saw him against Forest Green booing at 1 0 half time for me was just bizarre. I just couldn't understand it because she's still in the game. I couldn't appreciate the Mansfield situation, but at the same time, you know, as, as a football fan, you, you've got to ride the highs with the lows. And City have had a few highs in recent years, have absolutely got it. At the moment, you know, they couldn't be probably further away from that situation, but. Sometimes you've got to you've got to ride in tough times to get the good times back. Yeah, indeed. I uh, just want to raise this comment here from Tony. Thanks for your comment. Seems no consideration in any decisions at the minute about our more elderly supporters who are ultimately uh, the regular supporters who travel week in, week out, i.e. block and ticketing accounts. Uh, Martin here as well. Close to a 1,000 members in the independent supporters group and still no acknowledgement or dialogue from the club, which tells you everything about the way the club uh, communicates. Um a little bit difficult, crystal ball time, but if this trend of decline continues, there's a real risk that City could fall into non-league. Just how concerned are you about that, Jason? And what would happen to the club if that, that does indeed happen? Really concerned at the moment. Um, like I say, we've talked a lot about it tonight already, but you know the, the way that the support of them will drop off at the moment is a real worry. And that what does that do for the budget next season? As Gaz talks about when... We rely on season ticket sales for that budget. That's going to be a real problem there. And I just feel at the moment in time, we we look like a bit like Scunthorpe did a couple of years ago or Oldham before that, where you, you're just kind of drifting, getting worse, the mood's getting worse and worse. And there's that there's that real danger that we could end up in a real relegation battle next season. Um, as much as you talk about, you know, keeping Graham Alexander there, and I'm certainly not going to tell say here that we should sack at this moment in time. It just feels inevitable that we'll sack him in September because we'll, we'll go for the summer. Science of his players, we will start well, we'll sack him and we'll just go again like that. And, and you really worry now that we're on that, that decline now where it's just going to continue to get worse and worse unless something dramatic happens that's different. And as we talked about, there's just nothing about the football club this season and the way they've, they've gone about doing things, the decisions that they've made that give you any hope and, and, and belief that, that things will get better because just, there's just been nothing to cling on to. Um, it, it really is incredibly worrying at this moment in time so yeah I'm, I'm really worried about what that might do and in terms of if we were to get relegated there's a danger that could be the end of the football club because we go back to the rent that we talked about the incredibly high cost that played the ballet parade it's something you can just about afford right now um with the, with the money you get in league two but dropping into non-league is a massive revenue drop there's, it's very different in terms of the tv deal and, and in terms of the money you get from 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 the from being that league that it could be the end of the football club because it just suddenly might not be viable at that moment in time or you wouldn't look huge debts and you're relying on someone to pick them up which is probably not going to happen so yeah it's it's a really big concern right now and it, it, as i think as gaza talked about earlier it's, it's almost it is some of the lowest we've felt really because it, it feels like it, it we're heading down that that direction like i say it's it's like this slow extinction of brother city at this moment in time yeah, uh, Chris here does try and offer a bit of a bright side to this. Bright side, you're not going down and the seven points off the playoffs. Hopefully, we'll regroup and go again next year. Uh, if you're going down, different matter. Lots of changes in managers never helps. Um, Gaz, going into the summer, what are the things that you want to see happen that will give you reassurances that actually they care about it at the top of the club and they're going to try and make positive changes to get things back on track? Um. They've got to get the fans engaged again somehow. They've got to stop these people that are obviously not going to games and saying that they're not going to renew. We've got to make sure that somehow we get them back and they do renew. Um, but as as we talked about previously in the pod, I, I, I think the only way you're going to do that is by seeing some kind of significant change uh, near the top of the football club. Now, whether that is a change in ownership or whether that is uh, a change in like Jason spoke about before I think that's probably the minimum that you need to see to get people to sort of say well actually we're trying to do something to make, to make this this change happen to make, to make something different happen next season because at the moment it just feels like we're repeating the same mistakes every single summer 
it feels like we're going from manager to manager to manager, as Jason said. Who'd be surprised if it gets to September and Alexander's brought some players in over the summer? We don't start well and, and then we sack him and bring someone else to, um, or Mark Truman's in temporary charge again, like he has been before. Um, the worry as well is that because it took so long to appoint Graham Alexander in the first place and, and there were people that were obviously openly saying that they weren't interested in, in taking the job, it makes you wonder who would be available to come in or would want to come in if um, Graham Alexander was to leave. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the only way you're going to get these people engaged and get people back buying season tickets and wanting to come to Valley Parade again is to see some kind of change at the top. Maybe that be, like I say, a director of football or some plan being put into place that makes you think that the the, the, the club's not built on sand and if things aren't happening straight away on the pitch, that there is something to fall back on. Um, if the manager doesn't work out, there'll be another manager that'll come in that'll fit the plan that we've got in place. We'll have a we'll have a strategy of how we want to play. We'll have a strategy of players that we want to recruit. We'll have a a, a, um, a youth policy that we'll stick to, and and then there's something to like I said to fall back on when things aren't necessarily great on the pitch. And possibly you need as a minimum a director of football to come in to enact that change and, and for something to start to happen like that. Yeah, I know that there's a bit of a narrative twist on Phil Parkinson at Wrexham at the moment and there seems to be a bit of discontent there. Jason, could there be a fairy tale reunion, do you think, at some point? Is that is that what it needs? Does it need a figure to galvanise the, the club? I mean, we've seen it at so many clubs where that one man can have a huge impact. I mean, to be honest, I thought Mark Hughes would be that figure for you guys. I really was convinced he would get it over the line for you. It didn't turn out to happen. But is there someone else out there who could actually uh, bring that to the fore? Yeah, he likes things so on you. And yeah, someone like Phil Parks and if some fans are sick of him, well, you know, let's talk. We'll <laughs> do something about that. Um, I Like you, I thought Mark Hughes would have that. And I think to the extent he did, he did. He really galvanised supporters and he definitely brought renewed interest into the football club and a real buzz back. And the atmosphere at times was absolutely fantastic, I think, over over his tenure. I think the biggest problem is, is and it goes back to Phil Parkinson years, and I always talk about it all the time, so anyone who reads my writing is probably bored of me talking about this uh, or talking to me in the pub about this. But with Phil Parkinson, there was a lot of difficult moments where things didn't go very well at the club and where he, you know some, some moments where it was really sticky. But as a club, we always stuck with him. We always guided him to get through it, and he always came out the other side bringing success to the football club. And there was that faith there. And ever since Phil Parkinson has left, no matter who the manager has been, every single manager, as soon as there's been a tricky moment, we've sacked him, we've got rid of him, or, or they've resigned like David Hopkins or something like that, or Simon Grace inside not to, not to be there. And some of those appointments were the wrong ones. So I'm not saying every single one of them was right. And if we would stuck with them, we'd be much more successful now. But when we've had our decent appointments and people who've, who've proven themselves like Mark Hughes and then they've had a sticky moment, we've just changed it too quickly. And that's been our problem. And we all we need is a Phil Parkinson. I, I deal with him. I'll certainly take him if he's available. But we need someone who we can just be prepared to, to back in those difficult moments, let them get through it and come out the other side because we're always going to have that as a football club. And any club who's successful, you know, up and down the land, They've always, the manager who's been there for a while, have always gone through those difficult moments. And, and until we're prepared to do that and find someone we can believe in, I think we're just stuck on this managerial hamster wheel where we'll just keep changing it season upon season. Lewis, as the outsider, any crumbs of comfort you can offer Bradford City fans kind of going forward at the moment? Well, you asked me nearly an hour in now, yeah. <laughs> 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 um, the, the club of comfort, and I think Chris makes a really fair point in that comment, is that City not going to go down this season. You're not that far away from playoffs. Listen, you're not probably going to get playoffs the way things are at the moment. But what I will say is, I think you've got a manager that's capable of managing the players, but he's also capable of managing your upwards as well, in terms of actually helping build the infrastructure. And I think you know he's been at, at clubs, not everyone, don't get me wrong, but he's been a proven winner. I think he gives you a, a decent chance to do well in this division. And, and I say do well is to be better than where City are at the moment. Obviously, City want promotion, absolutely, because of the believe the size of the club deserves to be much higher. I completely appreciate that. But I, I think the club of comfort is that Alexander is there. I think, obviously, you know, the, the obviously the, the debate about getting somebody possibly above is, is one, actually, I think, 
Alexander will need to be consulted on to get a sporting director, football director, whoever that looks like, because Graham Alexander might feel that that might not be the right appointment while he's manager. I think obviously then the conversations go, does do the likes of Stefan and, and Ryan need that extra support from a footballing side to help manage that relationship better? I, I don't know. Um, the crumb of comfort is, is that City are um, the, the role Kane team in terms of where they are in results based, just not consistent enough. That's my that's my biggest thing when you look at the outside. And City are capable of winning games six, seven on the bounce, but they're also capable of losing six, seven on the bounce. And sometimes the defeats are, are not pretty either, which obviously really does exaggerate the situation City in. The crumb of comfort is, is that compared to other clubs that we've seen in the past, you know, from what I believe, and I've not been not seen any news otherwise, you know, the the players are getting paid, everything's on time. You know, we've seen situations in the past in other clubs where that isn't the case. So that's a massive crumb of comfort. People might say what they say about Stefan Rook, but um, he seems to be financially, like Jason said earlier, he's happy to probably plug them gaps. The the crumb of comfort may get slightly smaller depending on the sustainability and amount of season tickets and the people coming through the turnstile. That'll be a big test. And I think this whole, you know, ethos of Bradford City having the amount of people coming through the turnstiles, doing all that kind of stuff to help increase the budget to get better players in. Um, it's almost been a bit of a, a slow snowball to use kind of Jason's analogy with a slow extension. It's kind of been built up at the very beginning. And at some point it was, it was going to be at some point pretty inevitable that the season ticket price is either going to have to go up to meet demands, to meet the economy of the way thing is, or we're going to have to change because Bradford City are in not such a lucrative position as what they were in previous years. There's, there's some positives to take for City fans, and I know that's really difficult, but as an outsider looking in, I think there definitely is. Um, all it takes now is to get this season out of the way, just, for, just get rid of this season. It's a cliche to say, but get get your plans in order, like Gaz said and Jason said. Get a plan, get a strategy in place, both from a footballing perspective, from a business perspective. Align them together, get them shared out between the fans, get that engagement going again, um, and see what you can possibly do next season. Because you can't go in, you can't go season by season the way City have been doing because it's not working, is it, at the moment? Um, and what it needs is is a good long term vision, a long term plan of them milestones of what City need to do to to be successful again. And that success for Bradford City at the moment is probably getting promoted to League One. But at the moment, very short term, the success is to be just in and around and playoffs on a very consistent basis rather than yo yoing up and down the league. Yeah, I've got to say, um, Michael, Jesus, crumb of comfort, we are sustainable and solvent. <laughs> and also, I heard Bradford Park Avenue are as well. Yeah, fair, fair enough. We have got Mr. Bradford Park Avenue <coughs> on the podcast, to be fair. Um, well, I hope you fans of international football, because maybe England can put a smile on some Bradford City supporters uh, this summer. Um, hopefully, we'll we'll wait and see. Uh, but I think we'll we'll wrap things up uh, there. I want to thank everyone who got their comments in. I'm sorry we couldn't bring up all your comments. There were some absolutely fascinating ones in there. Um, and if you're watching this later, please do add comments on the video and, and let us know what you've you've thought of the discussion tonight and your feelings on Bradford City as a whole. Uh, if you've not liked the video already please do pop a like on the video and um, if you've been watching on youtube or twitter and if you've li listened on spotify please do leave us a rating and review and don't forget you can subscribe on youtube and spotify for more content on all our teams across west yorkshire as well uh, okay well gentlemen thank you very much for your time gareth jason and lewis will be back again soon so please do keep an eye out for more content from us until then thank you very much for watching <laughs>